Good morning, good afternoon, good to see everybody. Please silence your cell phones too. We had angelic music interrupting us while I was preaching the first service. All right, we're going to pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to understand it and obey what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we started a new series last week called the Psalms of Ascent. And so we start with Psalm 120 last week, which is the beginning of that category of Psalms. There are several categories of Psalms. There's 150 of them. And this is one of the last categories, Psalms of Ascent. I can't tell you how much the book of Psalms mean to me personally. I try to read 10 Psalms a day so I could get through uh, the book of Psalms a little bit more than every two weeks. Um, the Psalm is the songbook of the church and the prayer book of the church. It, it combines both. Uh, as a matter of fact, in church history, they uh, often wrote psalm, songs based on the Psalms, and we still see that today. And in the days of Christ, the Jewish people actually sang the Psalms. So uh, I can't tell you how important, I can't overstate how important it is. Through some of my most challenging days uh, for a period of years, I would literally put the Psalms on the audio Bible and pray for several hours while I was listening to the Psalms because the Psalms enable us to connect to our emotions not just our spirit, and it is an honest depiction also of human nature, as it shows uh, sometimes the psalmist is very depressed. Uh, the psalmist is not always in great faith and in joy, and they're honest with their emotions. Jesus was a person that was very connected to himself emotionally tells us in John chapter 11 that he wept, that he was filled with joy, all in, uh, in chapter 11 of, of Luke. And uh, we see, uh, and actually other places, Jesus was angry, Jesus was grieved. So there's nothing wrong with being a whole person and being connected to uh, every aspect of your life. And that's what the book of Psalms does better than any other book as far as I'm concerned. And so I live in that book, and it has really been a lifesaver for me throughout the various journeys in my own life. And so, as I said, this category of Psalms is called the Psalms of Ascent. And the word ascent has to do with climbing to a higher place. By implication, it's referring to the fact that we are on a journey in life but God has called us throughout all of the challenges and all of the various aspects of life that are unpredictable that we go through, God expects us to continue to climb. And so it's not like we get in a Holy Ghost helicopter and the helicopter drops us off on the top of Mount Everest. That's not how Christianity works. You get saved instantly and you become a new creation which means the old creation is decreated and then God gives you a new creation. There are three cycles in the whole Bible, creation, decreation, and creation. That's another sermon I won't get into now. But when you're saved, all of that takes place instantaneously. Your old nature is then crucified, creation, decreation, and then you are born again of the Spirit. And what happens there is your spirit is instantly saved. Your spirit has several uh, characteristics so that you understand what part of you is your spirit. Your spirit is your conscience that shows you right and wrong. Your spirit is where you have communion with God. And your spirit is where you have to intuition, where you have a sense of what's to come and or a sense about people or a sense about things beyond this physical world. Those are from your 
human spirit, the characteristics that God gave you in your human spirit. So when you are born again, when you're saved, your human spirit becomes one with God's spirit. It's almost like a marriage. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that when we are united with Christ, we're united with him in spirit. So when you're married to a human, you become one flesh. When you're married to God, you become one spirit with Christ. So you're instantly saved. You cannot do anything more to be saved. You can't be good enough to increase your salvation. You cannot uh, memorize the Bible and be even more saved than you were when you first got saved. But the rest of your life is a journey catching up with your spirit. Your mind and emotions are not saved. Your mind and emotions are renewed. And they're renewed through difficult times, through hard terrain, through challenges. Most of them are beyond our control. And so the Psalms of Ascent are focused on how we go from where we are here to where God wants us to be. But it's also implying that we are growing spiritually, that we're not just staying the same. And so salvation is instant, but our journey as Christians is a gradual process. Somebody say, I'm a process. We are all part of a process. And so we begin a journey, and hopefully, throughout all of the trials and struggles and the things we go through, we're still ascending. We're not on a helicopter dropped off on a mountain, but we're walking and talking, dealing with issues and problems. And here's the good thing. The Psalms of Ascent, as what with all the Psalms, were meant to be sung or mused over or taught together as a community. They never traveled. This is the point of the uh, Psalms of Ascent. They were written for the Jews when they were traveling three times a year to go to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. The Feast of Pentecost that took place in the, the beginning of the spring. The Feast of Weeks, or uh, I'm sorry, the, the Feast of Passover, did I say Pentecost? The Feast of Passover that took place in the beginning of the spring, and then 50 days later, the pe Feast of uh, Pentecost, or Weeks, that took place uh, also in the beginning of the summer, the end of the spring, and then in the autumn, you had the Feast of Tabernacles. And so there were three times a year, as we read in Exodus chapter 22 and 23, also it's in Leviticus 16, we see three times a year the Jews together as a community left wherever they were and literally took their whole family. Sometimes, I'm guessing most of the time, they traveled with other people in their region. And when they got to Jerusalem, there were seven hills that they had to ascend and descend before they can go up to the mountain which Jerusalem was on, which was directly across from the Mount of Olives in between the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And uh, the mountain is where Abraham sacrificed his son on Mount Moriah. And many people believe that's where Jesus was crucified. And so we see the Jews had to cross these hills or many mountains and then they had to ascend to the mountain of God in order to uh, celebrate these feasts to go to the Temple Mount on Moriah. And so all of these physical experiences always depicted spiritual abstract realities. Everything that you see in the world is a reflection of a greater spiritual truth that uh, we don't know. Uh, in the great book written by Matthew Peugeot on the language of creation, it talks about how in Genesis chapter 1, when it talks about the heaven and the earth, the earth represents the whole material world of the universe, not just the land of earth, and the heaven represents the invisible spiritual world. And so there's a, and we're talking about the way the Jews thought. So the Bible is not just some scientific thing. It has to do with a lot of theological messaging, telegraphing deeper truths that the natural world shows. As the heavens declare the glory of God, the word of God depicts deeper meaning than what we could see 
with just a natural eye. So when it says songs of ascent, the Jews ascending three times a year. I mean, we're talking about putting a lot of money in. We're talking about travel. We're talking about bringing enough food, bringing enough clothing, uh, uh, having enough to drink. They had to share resources with each other. Part of the way you're going to get through the journey of life in this very difficult wilderness of, of the world is by being part of church, being part of community. Can you imagine one person trying to make three trips a year to Jerusalem unless they lived in proximity to Jerusalem? Man, that would have been hard if they lived in the outer regions outside of Jerusalem. Uh, and so they had to deal with robbers. They had to deal with rain. They had to deal with inclement weather. They had to deal with um, you know, provision. They had to deal with uh, climate that they couldn't predict. There was a lot of stuff going on. Well, that's the same way we are when we are walking with God. There are highs and lows. Seven hills, that means they went up, but they actually went down. If there's a mountain, there's a valley. Well, we have highs and lows in our life. But through it all, we should constantly be growing spiritually. There an opportunity, every problem is an opportunity to ascend the hill of the Lord. How do you do that? You don't look on the earth for your help. You look, lift up your eyes to the one who made you and created you. That's what this psalm is all about. I love it. And so as we dive into the actual psalm itself, We're going to go to verse 1. And the writer said, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Again, the hills is a metaphor for the spiritual reality of heaven where God dwells. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help comes from. Meaning, you're never going to get all you need in this world. There's never one person who will fully satisfy you. If you're terribly lonely and you're dealing with a lot of emotional uh, issues and uh, maybe always depressed or whatever, if you think marriage is going to solve that, you are wrong. You better get healed up yourself with God because then you're just going to bring that stuff into your marriage because there's no help, full help on the earth. It says here, my help comes from where? Above. God created us so that we can't get everything we need on the earth. Not even from relationships. God created us so that we'd long for him for absolute and ultimate fulfillment. So I lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help comes from. Wow, that's deep. Some people depend on the United States for their sustenance. Some people depend on their friends, their business, their employer. Some people depend fully on something else. Some people have an entitlement mentality. They don't think they could get anything themselves. They have to depend always on someone else. Ultimately, your help comes from the Lord. Some would say, my help comes from the Lord. That's what he says in Psalm 121. My help comes from the Lord. And then he says, who made heaven and earth? Wow. And so you have the contrast of someone who's lifting their eyes to the hills, meaning they have a personal need, but you see this incredible picture of an awesome God who created the heavens and the earth. The scientific word is cosmos. Man, we're talking about an amazing expanse of space that is expanding every day, every moment at the speed of light, creating new galaxies every single day. Isn't that hard to believe, right? It's expanding at the speed of light. So when God spoke it into existence, it constantly expanded. That's how powerful his word is. Unless God says, okay, I'm taking it back, his word is going to continue to be effective and powerful. He watches over his word, what? To perform it. And so he's talking about this God who created the huge expanse, included natural law, laws of lift, laws of gravity, marine biology, 
physics, subatomic physics, uh, all the technology that is possible today for AI, chat GPT, and all these crazy things. Where did it come from? It came from God with the natural laws of creation that he fixed in uh, and embedded when he made the cosmos. So he's talking about the one who created the heaven and the earth, which also represents the spiritual world that is even more vast than the physical, believe it or not. And the earth representing the physical dynamics of reality. So he's talking about someone who helps us that we personally can look to, but the one who made this incredible expanse of the world, of the universe. Man, including time and space. And so in the Bible, we have this picture of this enormous, immense God who is uh, transcendent, as many philosophers would say, but he's also imminent. He is transcendent, way above anything we could comprehend. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. We can't figure God out. If you could, you'd be God. The world through its own wisdom cannot know God, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.21. But this God is also imminent. He's close. He's near. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, Jesus knows. The Father said, uh, Jesus said, the Father knows the hairs, the number of hairs on our head. If one hair falls off your head, Jesus knows about it. If a swallow falls from the sky, God knows. Your Heavenly Father knows. So the Bible depicts a, a God who's vast, but a God who's near. A God who's massive, but a God who's minute. Do you know that in every atom is another universe? Picture that one. Do you realize that the smallness of God is so vast that you can't ever reduce it? It keeps unpacking more and more stuff. In every cell is a whole operation, a whole factory that we can't even understand that is determined by the language of God put in our cell called DNA. This is all crazy, but it's true. It's being proven by science. They think they, they used to think that the atom was the smallest particle in the universe until they had microscopes strong enough and they figured out, wait a minute, there's subatomic world out there. And they could reduce it even more with greater um, microscopes in the future. Every atom is a universe. So the minuteness of God is as great as the vastness of God. But yet, even though God made this vast universe, he still is big enough and cares for us enough to know the number of our hairs. It's incredible. I don't know the number of hairs. I know I have less hair than I used to. That's all I know. I, if you had asked me how many hairs do I have in my head, I have no idea. If I asked God, he'd say, oh, son, don't worry. I know the answer. You know. And so we could lift up our eyes to the hills. But we could also understand that this person that cares for us and loves us is the one who made the heavens and the earth. Oh, man, this is incredible. And then he says in verse 3, he will not let your foot be moved. Now, what does he care about your feet? As they say in Sunset Park, what does he care about your feet? Well, some people make a living with beautiful feet, definitely not me. I've abused them too much with my kickboxing and martial arts. They're messed up. But the point is, the uh, fact is, he's not talking about physical feet. Again, you've got to look at the theological messaging. What is it telegraphing here by foot? Well, what do you do with feet? You walk. He's talking about your journey. He's not going to let your foot be moved. 
He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And so when he says he will not let your foot be moved, he's not saying you can just do whatever you want, walk wherever you want, and follow God or not follow God, and don't worry, you know, he's got you. I hear that all the time. This is slippery, flippity jippet sloppy Christianity. That's not biblical. You can't do whatever you want and say, God's got me. No, it's not true. If you jump off a cliff, you could pray all you want, but you're going to hit the bottom. Now, God may have mercy on you, and you won't die, but most of the time you will die. But the point is, when he says he will not let your foot be moved, he's saying, as you look at all of Scripture, you have to understand the whole um, of the Bible and not just isolated text. He's not saying you can do whatever you want, walk wherever you want, and you won't slip. He's talking about those who have their feet firmly planted in the ways of God, in the, in the paths of God, and in the Word of God. That's why it tells us in Psalm 23, verse 3, that he leads us in the paths of righteousness. He doesn't say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack and you could do whatever you want. No, the context of you not lacking, or the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is the rest of it. He leads you. In other words, if you're not following him in the paths that are righteous, he won't provide. You have to learn to invert or reverse scripture to get the full meaning of it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, but... What does the rest of it say? He leads me to paths of righteousness. So when he says, he will not let my foot be moved, he's also implying by the rest of Scripture, which the Jews knew, that he's not going to let your foot slip as long as you're following the paths of righteousness, meaning he's not going to let the enemy come and trip you up. He's not going to give you more than you could take. He's not going to allow you to be overwhelmed by circumstances. As long as you're following his paths of righteousness, he's got you. Don't worry about it. This is not for salvation. This is just for experience. It doesn't mean if you get saved, you're never going to mess up. It doesn't mean if you mess up, you won't be saved. He's talking about the context, the Lord is my shepherd. If you want him to provide, then do what he wants. He's not going to finance your foolishness. And if you don't want your foot to be moved, then have your feet where they should be. Don't put your feet where they don't belong. And so we also see in Psalm 25, again, part of the Psalms that they knew. He expects us to pray this. Make me to know your ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and guide me. In other words, there are paths of the Lord. We have to know his ways and his ways, meaning how does, what is motivating God? What does God love? What does God hate? Knowing his ways results in us knowing his paths. We know what God would bless. We know what God won't bless based on knowing his ways. If you don't know his ways, you won't know his paths. Some of you think that you're following God, but well, you're not following God because you don't know his ways. People get offended and they say, oh, God is leading me to do this. God didn't lead you, you're just offended. You're acting out of anger. You don't know God's ways if you think that you're gonna be led in anger or hurt or pain. No, you gotta know God's ways. Once you know God's ways, then you forgive people. Then you'll know what God's will is after you forgive and release people. But if you hold on to bitterness and anger and say, well, God is leading me here and there. I'm leaving the church. I'm leaving my husband. I'm leaving. The... Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't tell me God. If you want to leave, leave. But don't say God is leading you. It's not God. You say it's God. Well, you don't know God's ways. You think God is like you. No, God is not like you. Thank God he's not like you and he's not like me. He's different. We need to know his ways, because he's not like us. So once we know his ways, we'll know his path. Psalm 25, verse 9 and 10, he leads the humble in what is right. You can't know his path unless you're humble. 
He says in another place, don't be like the mule who has to be led by bit and bridle. Don't make it like God has to force you. And so he leads the humble. That means that if you want God to keep your foot firm, you have to know his ways, you have to know his path, and you have to be humble. You have to let him lead you. You have to let the word speak to you. You have to let the word correct you. You have to let spiritual leaders correct you. You have to let mature people correct you. You have to let people know God better than you give you advice and counsel you, especially when you're a new Christian. And so he leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. That means if you're not humble, he's not going to teach you his way. Just invert it. If you're proud and arrogant, you don't want to listen to anyone. If someone corrects you and your hairs get up, and if you don't have hair, you just get up. I don't know. You get defensive. If that's your posture, then don't think that you could be led by God. And then it says, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant. Again, the qualification, steadfast love and faithfulness. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, but qualified paths of righteousness we walk in, keeping covenant with him. And so when he says he will not let your foot stumble, or be moved, it's implying as long as you're making some kind of effort to walk in his ways, keep his path, and walk in his covenant. That's why you need to sit under the word. You need to learn the first principles in our membership class. You need to be in a small group. Really learn the word. The more you know, the more you could be led by God. That's why you need church so much. Because what you don't know, someone else may know. And when you're weak, someone else will be stronger. When you fall, someone could pick you up. But woe to the person who's alone when they fall. He says he will not allow you to be moved. God is the foundation of our life. What happens when you build a house on a bad foundation? Jesus said, Everyone who hears my words and does them, does his word, is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And when the rain came, not if the rain came, when the rain and the floods and the winds came and blew and beat that house, meaning you're going to get beat. In this world, you will have trouble. You're going to get your butt whipped. He didn't say if, but he said when that happened, and that house is allegorically us, when we go through these storms, we did not fall because we were founded on a rock. That's why you don't build in wetlands. Some people are building on wetlands and expecting God to keep them. When their foundation is not on the word, it's based on their own opinion. Don't tell God what is right. Let God tell you what is right. And if you're not living right, don't expect God's blessings because God is not uh, schizophrenic. So you shouldn't be. But if anyone hears these words and doesn't do them, he is like a foolish man who built his house on the rock, and when the rains and floods came, hey, the flood is coming, get ready. The winds blow and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Then he also says, he who keeps you will not slumber. That means he's not going to be asleep at the wheel. Horrible tragedies take place when people are sleeping when they should be awake. If they're driving, it could result in their death. If they're sleeping and they're supposed to be watching their kids, it could result in their death. I once knew a guy who fell asleep when he was watching his three-year-old in, in the backyard. And the three-year-old died in their pool, drowned to death while he was sleeping on his chair in the backyard. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Worst nightmare of a parent. 
His marriage dissolved and he had nervous breakdown after nervous breakdown after that. All because he fell asleep when he was supposed to be watching his child. The good news is God never falls asleep. God is always watching. God is always looking after us. God always has his eyes open. He tells us, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. But God doesn't need anyone to tell him to watch and pray. God is always watching. God is always looking. Matter of fact, God is so serious about knowing what's going on in your life, what's going on in the world, that not only does God watch, but he's delegated authority to spiritual beings who roam the earth and watch. We see in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8, um, that Zechariah had a vision of these different colored horses. And Zechariah said, what are these? And they answered, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Wow, powerful. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have patrolled the earth and behold, the earth remains at rest. These are angelic beings that God has patrolling the earth. Zechariah 4 verse 10, talking about these angelic beings, they happen to be seven at this point. He said, these seven are the eyes of the Lord which range throughout the whole earth. They're ranging, they're looking, they're probing. Oh my God, this is not I, robot, this is I, God. Revelation 1 4, it's talking about Jesus, and it says, These, uh, he says, grace and peace to you. He's telling this to John from him who is, who was, and who is to come. That's where we get the word Yahweh from. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. I used to think the seven spirits is the Holy Spirit, but only one spirit. The seven spirits are these beings that are constantly watching for God and reporting to him. Powerful. So you not only have God who watches over us, you have his heavenly beings. That's why it tells us in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he names seven churches, but he says to the angel of the church, each church has an angel watching over them. We have a powerful angel watching over us because in January, we're going to be 40 years old, my God, and for us to have made it thus far, we have a powerful God with powerful angels watching over us. How many have been protected by angels? I know I have. I haven't seen any, but I definitely know I've been protected by them. So anyway, so God has his arsenal. And part of that arsenal is how he watches over us. Again, the Jews knew this. And so when they see how God watches over them, they would also understand that there are heavenly beings assigned to them. Daniel actually calls some of these heavenly beings watchers, but that's for another conversation. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Wow! Again, more deep theological, biblical messaging. It's not just what it seems. It's a lot deeper than that. What does it mean God is our keeper. The Lord is our shade and our right hand. The sun will not strike me. Well, the sun here represents being in the open desert, unprotected from the elements. Our life is like that. We're like walking in a wilderness right now. We're walking in a desert. And if you don't have protection from the sun, the sun could give you vitamin D or the sun could give you cancer, right? You have too much of anything, it's no good, right? Except for God. And except for your spouse. I just, I've just i been married for 43 years, so you got to say that too. But um, she has eyes everywhere too. People report, how did he do? How was it? Because she's probably in the other campus now. So you better say, Ted, I'm counting on you. Tell her I did good. Somebody say he did good. All right. Praise God. Uh, all right. 
Say nothing if you're not going to say something good, right? <laughs> so uh, the sun represents these raw elements beyond our control. I can't control the sun. I could close my eyes. I could put an umbrella up, but the sun is raw. It represents something we can't control with incredible power. And a lot of us are basically vulnerable to the elements in this world. I can't control what's going to happen. I can't control if there's going to be a government shutdown, if they're going to have a debt ceiling, if there's going to be uh, you know, a global recession, if there's going to be COVID, is there going to be this, that, and the other thing. I can't control the prices of housing or apartments. I can't control what other people do, how they respond, how they react. I can't control how they report my conversation. I can't control whether they misunderstand me, if they understand me, if they exaggerate, if they lie. I can't understand half of what I do, never mind someone else. And so in the world, you're going to have trouble. There's a lot of things that will strike you. That's what the sun represents. But it says the Lord is our shade. Wow. What does that mean? What is the theological messaging there? What is it referring to? Well, I was always wondering why Adam and Eve knew they were naked after they sinned. I'm thinking they were pretty smart before they sinned. They walked with God. They knew their human anatomy. Why is it they were naked? They said, whoa, I'm naked now? Until I understood the parameters of scripture. Genesis 1, it says in the beginning, God created, created the heavens and the earth, the spiritual and the material world. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, the word deep is the word abyss. And when it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, the abyss in Hebrew in that particular passage is Tiamat, which represented a volatile a god, goddess, actually, it was a female goddess who controlled the waves. She was called the, um, uh, the chaos monster. And uh, based, there's more to it that I'm going to say today. I don't want to confuse anybody. But basically, when God created the heavens and the earth, he allowed chaos. He allowed disturbance. He allowed unpredictability. That's what the waters in Scripture represent. The waters represent the waves, represent uh, 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 instability, represents chaos. It represents uh, 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 tumultuous things that come away, torrents, right? Things that you can't control. Many people have drowned. Even cruise ships have ships have gone under because they couldn't control the waves. So that's what it represents here. So God created this. He didn't get a, do away with it, but what did he do? It says he hovered over the face of the deep. And out of that chaos, what did he do? He said, let there be light. And there was light. In the chaos of your life, God may not take it all away, but he'll give you what? Light. He'll guide you. He'll give you strategy. Every problem is an opportunity to go to a better level of problem solving and light in your life. If there wasn't darkness, there couldn't be light. And a little bit of light dispels the darkness. And so we see... Before God made light, though, it said he hovered over the waters. Well, it was the Spirit of God hovering, and we know from understanding Scripture that this is the Shekinah. The Shekinah is the visible manifestation of the glory of God that emanates from the Spirit of the Triune Godhead, of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God was hovering over this chaos monster, said let there be light, and was able to take chaos and bring the created order, or take disorder and make it order. Well, after Adam and Eve sinned, guess what happened? 
The Shekinah covering them left and departed, and that's why they knew they were naked. Nakedness was not just referring to the human anatomy, it was referring to the fact that they were now vulnerable without God's protection. How many of you following this? They knew that they were missing something that had the ability to cover for their weaknesses, had the ability to make provision for their lack, had the ability to give them what they needed, had the ability to take them where they needed to go, to guide them, to lead them. Now they were naked because they couldn't control their own passions. And the glory departed. We see how God described how he led the Jews out of Egypt in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 32, it says in verse 9, The Lord's portion is his people, his allotted inheritance. He founded them in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness, just like our life today. And he encircled them and cared for them. He doesn't take us out of the wilderness, but what he does is he provides for us in the midst of the wilderness. He doesn't take the sun away, but he protects us and provides a shade. He doesn't say you're not going to have a hill to climb, but he's saying I'm going to be your help while you're climbing. He said that like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters or protects its young, spreading out its wings and catching them, so the Lord bears them on his pinions and guides them. Wow. So that they can ride in the high places of the earth. And so how did Israel make it 40 years in the wilderness? The same way God flooded over the chaos and brought order and said, let there be light. He hovered over the children of Israel as an eagle fluttering over them, protecting them, being a shade. In Psalm 103, verse 7, it says he spread a cloud for a covering over them to give them light by night. Sounds just like Genesis 1. And there's more we could say. That's why it says in Psalm 91, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall rest under the what? The shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He's my rock and my refuge, my God in whom I trust. He will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. So it's not just the Genesis 1 creation. It's not just Adam and Eve. It's not just the Jews. Now he's saying, I am going to be your secret place if you hide under my shadow, if you walk in my glory, if you walk in my presence, if you give me room in your life, if you allow me to lead and guide you, my presence will cover you in the midst of the storm. And uh, he says, you will not fear the terror of night. Didn't say night wouldn't come. It says you won't fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. The word pestilence and destruction in the Hebrew are two words that refer to false gods or deities called destruction and pestilence that would attack them. It, it was actually something like a demonic attack that they were looking at here. And so... The Lord is our shade. He says, the Lord is our keeper. The Lord keeps us, even in spite of us. He keeps us from stumbling and presents us before his glory without blame, it says in Jude 24. The word keep simply means he guards us. He keeps watch. He cares for his children while we're on our journey. When we're following God, he keeps us. Or if the Lord wasn't on our side, we'd be in big trouble. And then he says in verse 7, the Lord will keep us from all evil. He will keep our life. The Lord will keep our going out and our coming in from this time forth and forever. Wow. All evil. Now what is delivering us, I'm sorry, keeping us from all evil mean? Doesn't mean you're not going to experience pain. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through trouble. Doesn't mean you won't grieve. Doesn't mean you won't have trauma. 
It doesn't mean you will be protected from what everyone else goes through in this world. It doesn't say that. It says he'll protect you from evil. Now, evil is a lot different from what you think it is. Evil doesn't refer to pain. It doesn't refer to challenges. We may call it evil. Evil refers to falling away from the will of God. It refers to the enemy taking advantage of your life and taking you off track, taking away your purpose, destroying your walk so that you perish. Paul the Apostle in 2, Corinth, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he said, The Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. He said he's going to deliver me from every evil attack, yet in the next few verses he said, I know my departure is at hand. He was about to get his head cut off. He was about to die. Yet he said the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack. That doesn't make sense. It makes sense if you understand that the worst thing that can happen to you is not death. If you're a believer, that may be the best thing. Not that you should try to do it on your own. That would be sin. But when we pass from this world, we go into glory. Paul didn't consider physical death evil. What he considered physical death was missing his mark, leaving his assignment, and not being faithful as a preacher of the gospel in the midst of his impending death. The worst thing that could ever happen to you is not death. It's walking away from God. When you walk away from God, especially when it's intentional, that's evil. Because you're allowing the evil one to persuade you to do his will. The Lord will keep you from all evil and keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Going in and coming out, all that is just referring to your just everyday life going shopping, taking care of the kids, taking the kids to a soccer game, uh, you know, uh, having fellowship with people, going to church. It just going and coming out is do whatever you do in life. In Deuteronomy 28, it says in verse 15, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God and be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you, then all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Then he mentions, cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you do until you are destroyed and quickly perish on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. That's the opposite of what it just said in Psalm 121, meaning... God will protect you going in and going out as long as you're walking in covenant with him. But you're going in and coming out is not guaranteed if you're not serving God. Your life will be rattled. It will be interrupted. And there will be huge disruptions in your life until you wake up and come back to God. Because the worst evil is that you die without coming back to God. Missing your assignment totally. Missing the mark. And so, as we wrap this up, I'll read that and then we'll wrap it up. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all evil. Thank you, Lord. He will keep your life. He will keep you going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Meaning there's no limitation of time. From this time forth, meaning today and forevermore, throughout eternity, God is always going to watch over you, care for you, provide for you, protect your going out, your going in and coming out, and be your shade, be that glory over your life to keep you from all harm. Yeah. Wow. Why would you want to run from that protection. Why would you ever want to take yourself out of the secret place of the Most High? Why would you ever be in a place where he wouldn't be your rock, refuge, shield, and buckler? 
It would be crazy. That's what he's saying in Psalm 121. Just invert everything he says and you'll get the full picture. Reverse everything he says and get the full picture. But thank God we're under his shade. Thank God we have the opportunity. Thank God he will bless our coming in and going forth. So who is God to you today? Are you following his paths? Are you trying to be in the path of righteousness? Are you keeping covenant with him? Are you being humble and letting him lead you? Or are you fighting him at every moment? Why don't you give in today? Why don't you let God be God in your life? Why don't we stand up? Lord, we, we just commit ourselves and our families to you. We know this is an incredible psalm related to protecting us. The God who made the universe is also the God of all the minutia. The God who's transcended is also the God who's personal, cares for us. Who am I that you care for me? Psalm 8. What is man? What is the son of man that you care for us? You made us a little lower than the angels, but yet you gave us the earth to steward. Teach us your ways. Keep us in your paths, oh God. Oh God, we want to know your ways. We want to know your ways through your word so we could know your path. Teach us moving forward. Some of us have some huge, massive challenges ahead without an answer, without knowing what to do. No easy solutions. But Lord, our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So, Lord, we just look to you for everything, all of our needs. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not lack all, all of our needs. We know you will provide. If there's somebody here today who doesn't know Christ as Savior, the first thing you could do to put yourself under his wing is to receive Jesus. And if that's you, if you want to receive Christ and you believe that he died for you, and if you're listening online, you believe he died and rose from the dead. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, but believe also in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The first step is to receiving Christ. And then it begins the journey in this howling waste of a world, this desert. You begin the journey of ascent until you get to glory and you're with him forever. Let's pray. For those of you who want to receive Christ, you can repeat this after me, whether you're online or whether you're here. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for, for sending Jesus to die for my sins. Thank you that he rose from the dead. And he took upon himself my sins so that I could be saved. Jesus, come in my life. Forgive my sins. And I will follow you all the days of my life. And for those who may have backslidden or fallen away from God, you could pray this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, take me back. Thank you that your blood was shed, not only for my sins before I knew you, but my sins after I know you. I believe that you have taken me back today. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Help me to walk again in your paths your purpose. 
I'm going to ask those who help us pray to come up in the front now. And while the worship team is ministering, if you need prayer for anything or if you receive Christ, then it's important to tell somebody else. That's why it says confess with your mouth to make it official and we could help you in your journey. So the worship team is going to come and we're going to uh, just enjoy that Shekinah, that presence that we get shelter and shade from from the beginning of time until even now in the present time he is our presence and our shade at our right hand that protects us from the elements so the worship team is going to minister Praise, worthy is your name. 
right now say, Lord, that we would seek you deeper each day that goes by. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. You all are officially dismissed. Thank you so much for coming. We pray that the Lord may bless you and keep you and the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. God bless you. Have a great week.